Hello, my name is Paul Rayburn. And I'm Neil Burridge. And in this webinar, we're going to discuss uh, diminution valuations and shed some light on what's often called the dark art. Diminution valuations are relevant in the context of dilapidations claims. And we expect that most of you have uh, a reasonable experience and understanding of what dilapidations are, but by way of brief background, they relate to, uh, in the context of what we're discussing, commercial and leisure properties, and the claims that landlords make against tenants, sometimes during, but usually at the end of leases, either at expiry or lease break, for repairs, redecorating, and reinstatement of tenants alterations that the tenant hasn't carried out. Now in this seminar, we'll be primarily re referring to uh, legislation and case law that's relevant in England and Wales, very similar applies throughout other parts of the United Kingdom and Ireland, and we'll refer to principal distinctions where we can as we go along. But you'll get a fairly ready guide as to the different statutory provisions around the United Kingdom and Ireland, and case studies, and other useful uh, quick guidance on dilapidations on DILAPS, D-I-L-A-P-P-S, the Dilapidations app, which you'll get for free uh, at either uh, app store. Neil? So both tenants and owners of commercial properties are involved in dilapidations disputes. Um, most leases upon expiry or exercise of a break clause will um, contain provisions so that the tenant has to leave the property in strict compliance with those provisions. So it will be repairs, redecorations and reinstatement. But um, from our experience, and probably from yours as well, very few tenants actually comply with those obligations and really are any works done prior to them vacating. So what, um, what usually happens is a charter building surveyor will be instructed by the owner of the commercial property, who will be trained in costing those defects that, that are present in a property and the works that are required to put the property back into repair in compliance with the lease and they will price those remedies and prepare a schedule of dilapidations that will then be served on the tenant and the negotiations will ensue. So this schedule of dilapidations or quantified demand as it's often referred to uh, as these days usually takes the form of an Excel document and as Neil said it will schedule in detail every breached item of repair, redecoration and failed reinstatement of tenants alterations and price those accordingly. The format and detail of that quantified demand is set out in parameters in the uh, dilapidations protocol, which became part of the civil proce procedure rules in England and Wales in 2012. So the tenant customarily instructs their own building surveyor who will um, negotiate with the landlord's building surveyor on a cost of works basis. And a tenant will invariably be pleased if the if their building surveyor comes at a figure far less than that sought by the landlord. So if they negotiate a financial settlement that is far lower than the original claim by the landlord, they will be pleased. But that settlement may well still be inflated because they do not use the diminution argument or do not apply what's known as a diminution evaluation cap. And this is a crucial point that we're going to talk about today. So what is this diminution in value cap? Well, a piece of statute in England and Wales, section uh, 18 of the Landlord and Tenant Act 1927. So we are talking about an old piece of legislation, yet still very much underused and probably more relevant now than it's ever been in these straightened economic times. <clears throat> so what this provides is that the amount of damages that a landlord will receive for, the, for breached covenants to repair, so for disrepair, will be capped at the lower of the calculated cost of the remedial works or the impact that damage has on the value of the property and often that is far less. Then at common law, so similar common law provisions apply to the other uh, obligations in terms of redecorating and reinstating. Around the UK generally similar law applies. In Scotland it's more diluted or weaker but it's still relevant. Uh, very similar statute to that in England and Wales applies in uh, the Republic of Ireland and on the Isle of Man. And in Northern Ireland, there is no such protection. So generally around the UK and Ireland, there is this protection. And as I say, that cap is that 
the damages that you as the tenant are obliged to pay will be the lower of the cost of the remedial works. That's the figure negotiated between opposing building surveyors. So as Neil pointed out, the landlord will be quoting initially, one would expect very high figures and very extreme remedies, and your own building surveyor will negotiate those down. And you may be very pleased with that figure that's arrived at because it's considerably less than the landlord quoted, but it's probably still far higher than the impact on the property's value. And as I've said earlier, far too many dilapidations claims are settled without using this diminution in value cap. Why is that? Well, quite rightly, building surveyors front dilapidations negotiations. They are the guys that are assessing the, the breaches and pricing the remedies. And therefore, it's come to be expected that the building surveyor will advise the client whether or not diminution in value is going to produce a lower outcome for them, a lower settlement. But the building surveyor isn't trained in that level of uh, expertise or judgment. The building surveyor is pricing the remedies and managing the contract of repair. It's the valuation surveyor, chartered valuation surveyor or valuer, Neil and I, who are trained in the valuation of commercial and leisure properties and therefore the impact that disrepair and other breached obligations might have or may not have upon that property's value. Neil. So yeah, so even though this statute, this uh, section 18 of the Landlord and Tenant 1927 has been around for nearly 100 years, as Paul has said, there's still very little known about it and its application in uh, dilapidations disputes is still minimal considering the amount of dilapidations claims that are served um, on, a, on an annual basis across the country, well, across England, Wales, um, and as Paul mentioned, the other principles that apply in, uh, in, in Scotland and, and, and Ireland as well. So as a consequence, many tenants will be settling claims at in excess of the true value of, of, of the diminution or the true value of the works that are likely to impact value. Um, we will come on to some case studies, but many properties have had the day and many properties have um, of, a, of an age that requires upgrade works or betterment that even if you even if it, you as former tenants had complied with your obligations those cost of works do not necessarily impact upon value yeah so to develop that point further in, this, in, in explaining why the impact on the property's value is less than the cost of works Neil touched on a very important point there most properties, by the time the lease expires, even if they were in, handed back in perfect compliance, so no disrepair, no redecorating required, no reinstating, which is unlikely, but in theory possible, that property is still probably going to be out of date, out of fashion. So to illustrate that with some examples, if you take, say, uh, a high street shop, we all know that the high street's been especially hard hit even before the, pande before the pandemic and a lot harder hit during it, if you take a shop of four and a half, five thousand square feet, that was once a very in-demand size of shop by fashion retailers. But of course, fashion retailers have been fleeing the high street for the last few years. So that size of shop now has very little to any demand at all. So that shop would require splitting into smaller units. It will be appreciated that in doing that, those splitting works, you're going to destroy a lot of the items that are claimed in a schedule of dilapidations, destroy or override or the term that is used is supersede. You're going to supersede those items. Similarly, if you look at the upper floors above that high street shop, they were once used for stock and storage. Retailers hold very little stock on site these days because of electronic point of sale control. And those upper floors will have far greater value in many locations by conversion to, re to, to residential. So again, in doing that, you're going to override, destroy or supersede a lot of the items that are claimed. You can imagine the same with um, offices, where even if they're in perfect condition at the end of the lease or at the break date, they're going to be, they're going to have fittings uh, that are out of date, out of fashion. You know, your avocado toilets, um, old style lighting, which gives people headaches. So the expectation would be LED lighting these days. The windows might be double glazed units, but they're 15 years old. They're in repair now, but they've got a short life expectancy left. The same might apply to the M&D. So the, there are lots of works that a landlord should and could be doing, irrespective of the condition of the property, in order to future-proof it, to secure the best letting going forwards. And it's the valuer's role 
whether or not the landlord volunteers that they're going to do these works, it's the, land, the, the valuer's role to know the market and say that these works are likely to happen on the balance of probabilities in the context of uh, the civil standard of proof. Neil? And it's, those, it's those same valuer's research and knowledge of, uh, for the industrial market. Many industrial units um, have become outmoded because of the poor cladding, um, thermal performance of a building, and, and the office element as well, as Paul mentioned, even the office element of some industrial units are outmoded and do not meet modern requirements. So you'll have poor outmoded lighting to be replaced by LG7 or similar 1980s, 1990s type uh, WC facilities that are just not required anymore. So regardless of the condition when vacated by a tenant, the, work, the works that are needed to bring it up to modern specification and uh, to meet modern requirements will uh, improve and supersede any works that, that are required in strict compliance with the former lease. And also some industrial units don't meet modern requirements in terms of height for stacking uh, and for keeping significant uh, stock on site. So, so the uh, roof height may well need to be increased, which again will, will damage or supersede any works that, um, that as former tenants you have to under, uh, undertake. So. As Paul touched on it, it's, it's understanding uh, the local market, it's, it's being involved with Paul and I are in, in, in transacting commercial properties on a UK basis and having that understanding to therefore apply to the, the, uh, the dilapidation process to say that those works are not required or, or the marketers have moved on significantly since this lease commenced and therefore improvement works will be required. Thanks, Neil. So the, what we're effectively doing to the building surveyor's costed schedule, the schedule of dilapidations, is applying two filters, if you like. So the first filter is that supersession thing that we were just discussing there. The reasonably assumed, the open market informed and therefore reasonably assumed alterations and upgrades to a property in order to best present it in the modern marketplace, to, to evolve it to its most marketable uh, use and expectation in the modern context. The second filter is to effectively remove items which are genuine breaches and they're identified and costed in the schedule, but which are, as we would term them, not value effective. Cost and value are two different things, but often carelessly transposed or assumed to be the same thing. Not all costed breaches will have any impact on value. There are myriad examples, just to give you a couple, if you assume, uh, if you picture first of all, say the rear elevation, on a high street shop, brick built, uh, turn of the century. A common defect that's highlighted is that the, the pointing between the brickwork is shrunken or friable. To remedy that is usually exceptionally expensive because you have to scaffold the back of the building. Yet building surveyors will tell us again and again that it's probably been like that for many years. It is an aesthetic thing. It's not something that's going to cause the building to tumble into a pile of bricks anytime soon. So it's purely aesthetic, not structural. So that's a genuine breach. It's identified often with a remedy cost in excess of 100,000 pounds. But whether or not it's done is not going to affect the value of that property in our judgment and in our experience. A better example might be if you picture a, a warehouse building and assume it's a, first of all a 50 year old thing. So it's got a low eave site, corrugated cement asbestos roof, and it's a very basic building. If that building, common sense will tell you this, let alone our market experience, if that building has a few dented cladding panels, the painted concrete floor surface is worn, the steelwork inside, the painting uh, has flaked off it and it's a little bit rusty. Those things are unlikely to impact the open market letability or value of that property. The prospective tenant's expectations are by definition lower um, for something that is older and therefore because it's physically less able than a modern building. It's got a lower eave site. It's got poor thermal properties. So inherent factors in that building make it worth less than its modern equivalent. And as such, those relatively minor atom items don't affect its letability or value. But if you then imagine those exact same defects, the dented cladding panels and worn concrete floor surface, slightly corroded steelwork, in a high bay distribution building that's five years old, common sense dictates that the prospective tenant for that building does have higher expectations and is unlikely to accept that without some compensation in terms of a rental reduction or rent-free period. 
So that perhaps illustrates how some items are and others are not, in our judgment, value effective. So that's the second filter that we are applying to the building surveyor's costed schedule, even if it's the lowest set of figures that the two building surveyors negotiating have arrived at between them. Neil. So then the valuer's role is then obviously to apply that to a valuation of a property. So you will see that many, many valuers refer to valuation A and valuation B. Well, valuation A will be the property in repair. So that's, that's the, the simpler of the two valuations because it's, it's a case of adopting comparable transactions, applying those to a particular property, whether it's office, retail or industrial or, or leisure and arriving at the value of, of the property if it was in repair. So what would the market pay for that property in repair? Uh, valuation B is then, as Paul has outlined the two filters, so it's, it's the remaining cost of works, which, which is commonly termed as the value effective work. So it's out of the schedule of dilapidation as it may or not be agreed, out of those works that have been identified by the building surveyors, what is the total of those works that will impact value and will not be superseded or will have or and or will have to be undertaken to relet that particular property? And the total sum of those is therefore deducted from valuation A to arrive at valuation B, which and the difference between the two is therefore the diminution, which is which is effectively the value effective works that that, that remain. Thank you, Neil. The other key head of claim that's often made is for loss of rent. And, and, and related losses. So that is the landlord's loss of rent and perhaps void rates after the initial three month void rates relief period, which the landlord is claiming it is suffering as a loss because of the period that is required to undertake the remedial works. Now there are many arguments, uh, more arguments against rather than in support of a, a successful loss of rent claim and we'll not go into all of those now. Suffice it to say that few succeed and those which do succeed tend to be, and, and they're very rare, but they tend to be where it is evidenced as an absolute matter of fact that there is a new tenant lined up, ready to take occupation of the property the day after the lease expires, but it can't do so solely because of the dilapidations. So not because of any other works that the landlord's got to, going to have to do to improve and upgrade that property, but solely because of the period that will be required to do the, the, the remedy of the dilapsed works. Now, all of what we've uh, discussed so far this morning is, uh, might appear to be very tenant biased. And of course, the diminution in value defence tends to be advanced by tenants. But there are bona fide circumstances in which landlords will seek out a diminution valuation. The first one, understandably, is if faced with a clearly opportunistic or deliberately low diminution valuation presented on behalf of a tenant the landlord then needs a very robust uh, rebuttal to that. The second circumstance is when the landlord is not as yet able or, or planning to do all of the works. And that could be for a number of reasons, including cash flow problems, which of course are all the more vogue these days when landlords haven't been receiving rent, of course. Now, the dilapidations protocol that I referred to earlier does provide that it's paragraph 9.4, that if a landlord isn't doing the works, doing all or, all or most of the works, then the landlord must take the initiative to provide a diminution valuation in support of its claimed loss. Now, we're going to illustrate some of what we've discussed now with um, two or three case studies. Neil? Yeah, so just to, just to expand on that point as well, I think um, landlords will, in the coming months, and uh, in particular in light of the pandemic that we're in at the moment, will have to prepare more and more diminution valuations to support their position because I think tenants when vacating probably be going to become more savvy to the dilapidations claim and fall in, in commercial values and, and therefore seek to use that to their, their advantage. So I think landlords going forward will have to prepare more and more of these, these diminution to support their position. But yeah, as Paul said, we're going to uh, illustrate with a few, a few case studies just to show in practice how uh, the the items that we discussed have been, have been uh, adopted and applied to various properties. So yeah, we're just gonna illustrate with a few examples. Um, this first example was for tenant that we were instructed to prepare a diminution evaluation. Um, the landlord's initial claim was at 1.2 million, as you can see from the slide. It was an office building in central London. Um, and this had been vacated by the former tenant in breach of their repair, redecorating and reinstatement obligations. Um, 
but one of the points we raised earlier was it was stuck in a time warp. The officers were 1980s, 1990s specification. And in central London in particular, that market had long gone. So as a result, a large proportion of the claim would not be value effective as it would be superseded by improvement works to WCs, to kitchen facilities, to lighting, suspended ceilings, etc., that would pretty much damage the works that in strict compliance with the lease the former tenant had to undertake. So in this case, our diminution in value was at £250,000. Um, the result at mediation was £380,000. So a significant saving from the uh, landlord's claim, which in this particular case also included a loss of rent. As Paul outlined, the loss of rent would not be, would not be supported because the landlord would experience a void because they would have to undertake significant improvement work so the, the officers were not in a fit state to let at the valuation date because of the improvement works that required so we, we could argue against both the cost of works and also the loss of rent but on the flip side this was a uh, the second example was one that we did for landlords so again as paul mentioned an opportunistic tenant that um, sought to remove the majority of the dilapidations claim by um, from their point of view, trying to put forward a case that the offices would be converted to residential use. Uh, so the landlord's claim, our client was £595,000. Um, the response was £432,000, which was supported by the uh, diminution in value. Uh, sorry, the tenant's response was £432,000, but the landlord's claim was supported by the diminution in value because all of the works will be value effective. Those offices still had a market, they were of a specification that would still have demand in this particular location. Uh, and as a result, the settlement was 515,000 pounds, which was well in excess of the tenant's diminution at 60,000 pounds, which was very opportunistic on the basis of residential conversion. And then a retail one again for tenant. Um, so the principles that we discussed before, this was a large retail unit in an area that had been savaged in terms of retail demand. Um, many upper floors so there were two large upper floors that just there was no requirement for from any retailer's perspective in the modern context but in this case it was unusual where the building surveyors had reached an agreement so the cost of works had actually been agreed between the building surveyors at £840,000 um, which made our job a little bit easier because we actually knew the parameters that we were working to rather than the landlord and tenants building surveyors being in dispute on costs so our diminution valuation was at £580,000, which is still high, but there was a strict requirement for the tenant to remove asbestos within the retail unit and within the property, which will be value effective regardless of the use, the asbestos would have to be removed. So there was no getting away with that particular element, but the remaining works which related to decoration and putting the upper floors into repair would not be value effective. And the settlement was at £615,000. And then an industrial tenant, large distribution center of 50,000 square foot where the landlord's original claim was half a million pounds. Uh, again, the costs were agreed between the building surveyors at that level, so we knew the, the maximum claim that we were dealing with. But in this particular uh, scenario, the, the officers were outmoded, so there was demand for the distribution center because of the location, but from a modern tenant's perspective, a modern occupier's perspective, the offices had to be upgraded. So brand new heating system, air conditioning installed, and just an improved specification for the WCs. They all had to be undertaken by the landlord, which wasn't our, our clients, the former tenant's responsibility. So the supercession argument came into play, which assisted in the settlement of 330,000 pounds, which was pretty much in line with our diminution in valuation. So thank you very much for listening to our webinar. I'm sure it's been quite riveting for you. To conclude and to summarise, you hopefully appreciate that for a tenant to settle a dilapidations claim based on a cost of works assessment by building surveyors alone would be foolhardy because in the balance of probabilities, especially in the current market, the impact of dilapidations on the property's value is probably going to be a good bit less than the lowest cost of work assessment. Similarly for landlords, bear in mind that it's always useful to have a reliable diminution value to hand, A, to rebut 
any opportunistic diminution valuation advanced by tenants, and as Neil rightly pointed out, that's likely to increase in incidence considerably going forwards as tenants try to hold on every hold on to every penny in difficult economic times. And also landlords will require diminution valuations per paragraph 9.4 of the protocol, i.e. when they're not able or not actually as yet doing the dilapidations works. Thank you for your time. Any queries, please get in touch with Neil or myself. <laughs>